Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the ACES Connection sponsored webinar, The Human Impact of Climate Change with Elaine miller Karras, Executive Director and Founder of the Trauma Resource Institute and Kelly Doty, MA, Program Manager of Strengthening Families, Youth for Change in Paradise, California. This is our third and final in a series of three webinars on climate change and adverse childhood experiences. I'm Carrie Sipp, a community facilitator at ACES Connection, and we have with us Allison Sabula, Morgan Vane, and Gail Kennedy behind the scenes, part of our webinar production team here at ACES Connection. We'll get started in just a minute, but first, I would like to go over some housekeeping, if Allison, you'll advance the slide. Um, the webinar runs for about 60 minutes. We'll be recording it, and we will make it available um, the recording and the slides on ACES Connection um, to all the people who signed up for the webinar. We have time scheduled at the end of the presentation for your questions. And if you um, have questions, uh, you can use the Q&A function on your screen to do that. We'll com be compiling the questions, so feel free to share your questions at any time during the presentation. Now let's go back to the slide about um, ACES Connection. Um, as, we, as you know, ACES stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. ACES Connection is the human and digital catalyst that supports the worldwide ACES and resilience movement. We tell the movement's authentic stories. We are an active social network. Today, I just checked it, we have 38,077 members. Uh, we recognize the impact of adverse childhood experiences in behavior and health and we promote trauma-informed and resilience building practices and policies in communities and institutions. Um, we invite you to join ACES Connection. It is free to join. Um, to join, just go to acesconnection.com and click on join. And we will welcome you into the fold here. Um, if you look on the, if you'll go to the next slide, I think it is Allison, the map the movement, um, you will find that there are statewide initiatives where there are the yellow dots, and um, we've got a new one to add. South Carolina will go on the map soon. Thank you, South Carolina. If you look at the map on the movement tab, you'll find ACEs initiatives in your state. Um, and then I encourage you to get involved with the local ACEs initiatives. The green dots on the map are the local ACEs initiatives. And if you don't find one, um, get in touch with us here at ACES Connection and we'll help you get one started. So let's move to the next slide. And um, I am happy to introduce you, I think it's the slide just before this one too, um, to, to introduce you to this webinar. Um, this webinar could not be more timely as last weekend marked the one year anniversary since the Paradise Fire started. And in that fire, 85 people lost their lives. Hundreds of homes were destroyed, including the home of one of our guests today, Kelly Doty. Fires, of course, still rage in California, where many times the governor has issued, where the, the governor has issued a state of emergency. Um, right now, uh, there's a lot of focus on California, but record-breaking cold is hammering the Midwest of the United States and in parts of China and India the air is so toxic that people have been urged to stay inside. Today, Elaine will share more about the model she has helped create, the community resiliency model, and is used worldwide to help people prepare for disasters and recover from everything from tsunamis to earthquakes, fires, and other natural disasters. As I said too, we'll hear from Kelly, but a bit about Elaine miller Karras, my friend is MSW, LCSW. She is the director and co-founder of the Trauma Resources Institute, Trauma Resources Institute, and author of the book, Building Resiliency to Trauma, the Trauma and Community Resilience Models. She's worked internationally to bring healing to the world's community. Her models to date have been brought to, we'll have to correct this one because Elaine just told me that um, because her, um, the community resiliency model is included in the social emotional learn ethical learning program um, that the Dalai Lama has endorsed that was put together by people at Emory University with her help. She is now in 109 countries. 
um, in Asia, Africa, North America, the Middle East, South America, and Europe, um, and probably more places now. Um, she is recognized as an international speaker and author and has presented the community resiliency model at the Skoll World Forum and the United Nations. And Lane's book was recently selected by the United Nations Curated Online Library as one of the innovations that can help meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Elaine is a founding member of an international transformational resilience coalition. You heard from Bob Doppel from um, ITRC um, about 10 days ago. And she's also a leading advocate with regard to the impact of climate change on human, the human condition. She is a senior consultant to Emory University's C Learning Program, that's Social, Emotional, and Ethical Learning Program inspired and launched by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in New Delhi, India in April of 2019. Um, as I said, she contributed to the trauma-informed and resiliency-informed chapter, chapter two, and that's the, the book that has now been seen in um, 109 countries. And that curriculum is based on the con con community resiliency model. Elaine is also on the faculty at Loma Linda's University School of Social Work. And now for a bit about our special guest, Kelly Doty from Paradise. Kelly is the program manager for Strengthening Families Program at Youth Change in Butte County and, an, and on the adjunct faculty of the Education, Child and Family Study Department. Kelly is very passionate about creating the best possible lives for children and their families. She has two young sons and her world absolutely revolves around them. She survived the campfire in 2018. Um, she and her sons did lose their home. Um, she believes that resiliency and having a positive outlook is the way forward and believes that when we model calmness and resiliency, it spreads hope with each interaction. So now um, we're gonna open the webinar up and include Lane, Elaine miller Terrace so that, um, she can share her thoughts with us. Um, by the end of this webinar, you're gonna be able to name two or more ways adults and children are impacted by climate change emergencies. You're gonna learn about um, paradise and how this community is rebuilding in the aftermath of the firestorm. And you'll be able to name the three phases of the intervention of the Community Resiliency Model Disaster Relief Program. So, hello, Elaine. Um, Come on in. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm not able to start the video, so I'm not sure. Um, there we go. Okay, um, well, thank you so much, first of all, ACES Connection um, and your team for inviting me once again to um, share our work um, with your community. Um, I, I just wanna start out first by just, um, I think that we have been very humbled in the Trauma Resource Institute to be uh, invited to many places around the world after human-made and natural disasters. And I am very honored to be here with, with Kelly, who most recently became a community resiliency model teacher after we first encountered her in paradise um, after the fires in a project that was, um, that was funded by the Red Cross that was very much inspired by Anna Bauer from First Five Mendocino. So I definitely want to give a shout out to them. But in, um, in, get, in going forward, I really, I'm so excited because this is, um, if you can go back to the, to the first slide again, I'm so excited to uh, share with you the Community Resiliency Model Disaster Preparation and Relief Program, CPRP, because this is the first public broadcast about its creation. We have had the Community Resiliency Model as an intervention, but recently within our organization, we have created a more expansive program. In fact, I was um, uh, chuckling because from when I first uh, sent you the, um, <laughs> the uh, objectives, we now have four phases instead of three. So that's how kind of hot off the presses this is because we're creating a whole program, not just only the intervention. So we'll be talking, I'll give you an overview of the CPRP program briefly, but the most important part um, for me of this presentation is Kelly's um, lived experience and also Carrie's um, living in Wilmington that has also been very impacted by the hurricanes in that part of the world. So if you can go to the next slide now, um, I wanna give you our definition of resiliency. There's so many different um, 
definitions that I've seen. And actually, I just kind of, I just changed this one a little bit recently because of the whole aspect of, I think of the importance of paying attention to the lived experience. So resiliency is an individual and community's ability to identify and use individual and collective strengths to respond with compassion, really, and strength at the challenges of lived experiences. And a person who I very much respect, who's done a lot of um, research from, um, on resiliency is George Bonanno from Colombia. And he says that people draw on reserves of resiliency when grieving. And how can we not um, touch into to the grief of the, of the human spirit when you just share the statistics of 85 people who lost their lives and so many thousands of people lost their homes in the Paradise Fire. So we are um, touching heartache and loss, not only um, with adults, but also with children. But also, I love Kelly's um, bio, because in meeting Kelly and getting to know her, uh, in spite of the tragedies that she's experienced, I've also been witness to her, um, her hopefulness about going forward with herself and her family. And we'll be able to hear from her in just a moment. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, these are the goals of the CPRP program, to prepare children and adults within communities with wellness skills, to create a common language which is trauma-informed and resiliency-focused, to provide a structure to further strengthen resilience so communities can respond to events with strength and compassion, and most importantly at the end, to create a cadre of community resiliency model teachers made up of professionals and natural leaders of communities. I think this is what um, we have brought to um, the field of disaster relief and, pre and preparation, is that we not only look at the mental health professionals and the medical professionals, but we also look at the natural leaders of communities who we have seen are very able to be able to share wellness skills that help people learn how they can get back into what we call the resilient zone. So next slide. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about the model because one of the most important things is creating a common language that is not about mental weakness, but it's about our strengths. So I'm going to share with you three simple concepts if you go to the next slide. And the first is called the resilient zone or the okay zone. And this is our zone of well-being. When we're on our, in our resilient zone, we can handle the challenges that life throws at us. I saw many people who were suffering when I was in paradise, but I saw many people in their resilient zone that even though they were having a hard time and they were sorrowful or maybe even angry or annoyed at some of the things that were happening, they were in that zone of resilience so that they could manage in the best way um, possible and bringing their, themselves in their best way to be able to respond to the challenges of what had happened to their community. So remember that the resilient zone is not a flat line. It has rhythm in it. So that rhythm can include being calm and, and, and happy, but also sometimes being sad and annoyed, but that we can manage it. So if we go to the next slide, we know that life experience, and I know that's a very busy slide, but notice this little thunderbolt on the left-hand side, and that's a kind of a trigger of a, um, or a stressful event. Um, a trigger means a reminder of something that happened in the past. So instead of being in this nice resilient zone in the center, we can get knocked into the high zone or knocked into the low zone. It is very normal to get knocked into the higher low zone. It becomes problematic if we, if we stay there. So in the high zone, we can be edgy, irritable, upset, anger, panicky. We can have angry outbursts, and this can happen to children or adults. Or we can be depressed, sad, disconnected, exhausted, feel, you know, experience fatigue, and sometimes not even be able to sense our body. So this is the human experience. And we've asked these questions all over the world, like how many of you listening have ever been in your high zone? If I could see your hands, you, you know, I'm sure most of you would raise your hand or in the low zone. And so wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to learn wellness skills that if we are knocked into either one of these zones that can happen from um, disasters, that we with intention can get back into our resilient zone or okay zone so that we can manage the rebuilding of our, our lives and our communities. So next, next slide. So these are now the four phases of the CPRP program. The first one is community preparation. And one of the things that we learned, and I know that I'm hopefully Carrie can add to this in just a minute, is that if a community is prepared before a disaster happens, then they have boots on the ground. And so 
as we are developing this program, we are trying to go into communities and teach people how to become community resiliency model teachers that Kelly is one now and she'll talk a little bit more about that. So then you can um, have CPRP wellness workshops before the disaster even hits. So that then um, when, when it does happen, and we hope it doesn't happen, but we know that they keep happening because of climate change and other reasons, that there are people there on the ground that can help with phase two. And phase two is immediate engagement. And so that means that the, that the disaster has happened and people are distressed. And how can we help them get back into their resilient zone so that they can manage what they're gonna to have to manage in terms of rebuilding their community or just get them, getting them back into their, um, helping them get back into their okay zone that we can do by very simple skills called conversational resourcing um, and, and, and grounding that can help them um, as this event is happening to them. Again, showing up as their best self, even though it's very stressful. And then phase through, three is um, after the disaster has, is over and you're rebuilding your community, people are still distressed. So this is where we can reach out to faith-based coalitions, first responders, families, survivors, and to do what we're calling our um, community resiliency model disaster relief meetings, these CPRP meetings so that people can uh, learn the school skills and even have boosters about the skills. And then finally, um, the fourth phase is that some people need more help than what a community model can provide that's a peer-to-peer -peer program. And so we would wanna be able to triage people to mental health professionals and, and also medical professionals for evaluations and also to community-based programs that may be able to provide support with either um, primary care or mental health services and services for children so um, that communities can become stronger um, in that aftermath with help of professionals if the person needs that. So if we go to the next slide, um, and these next slides are just what I just talked about, and I'm just gonna have you go through each one of these. This is phase one, and you're gonna have these slides available to you, phase two, phase three, um, and phase four. So if we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to just give you a definition. These are uh, the pictures of what I was just at the UN, the top picture in October in Rome. And this is a community resil resiliency model teacher training um, where people become, um, where they become um, teachers by, it's a four or five day program um, where people learn the skills to be able then to teach it back to their community. And I think if we looked in there, I think that Kelly's in this picture. So that's one of the reasons why I showed it because she most recently has become a teacher. So if we can go to the next slide, um, is that a person who learns the wellness skills, we call them a community resiliency model guide mm -hmm. and anyone can be a guide, even a child. So it is very, very, very important for us to all know that um, these skills are very adaptable and very accessible. Um, and once you learn them, what we're learning from the research is that it becomes more available to us. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to just mention briefly, because this is available for all of you free of charge, is that the United Nations, along with the publisher, um, which is called Rutledge, Taylor and Francis, have a curated library. And, this, and if you go to this curated library, you can see the um, uh, publications that the United Nations has um, suggested that can help with what we're seeing regarding climate change and also some of the other impacts um, that are happening to our world community in order that we can be part of the solutions. Next slide. So this is again gives you a little bit about, and, and again, we, we now know that we're in more countries because I just learned about the 109 yesterday. So we are really trying to make this a worldwide effort because just saying this is that we've learned that even though we may be of different religions, different colors, um, we may have different beliefs about how we can help the world, that we all across the world have a human nervous system that is designed in exactly the same way. 
And when we learn how to discern the differences between sensations and distress and well-being, then we have a choice. And when we have that choice, then we have um, the ability to come forth as our best self. But even more so than that, of course, we believe that that also helps our um, cortisol levels come down. We have oxytocin released in our nervous system. And that sense of well-being can also be part of our physiological experience that can change um, perhaps even our, our, um, our well-being in terms of not getting physical illnesses and perhaps even um, living our life a little bit longer. So this is uh, the research that's being done about our community resiliency model, and we hope to have more of it for you in the future. Next slide. So we have an iChill app where it's free that you can download it if you have a smartphone. Next slide. We're on social media and this is available to you so you can see all the different ways that our institute is on. You know, we tweet and we Facebook and we Instagram. The next slide. And this is just our vision um, to create resiliency informed and trauma informed individuals and communities. And we have this commitment to bring it to our world community. And I really wanna bring Carrie back on board at this point um, because we have, we also so believe in collaboration and we have a wonderful collaboration with ACES Connection with Carrie and Gail and Jane. And I'll turn it over to Carrie now to uh, let her uh, speak a little bit to how we've collaborated that we think has made a pretty nice impact in Wilmington, North Carolina. So well, ahead, <clears throat> thanks so much. Actually, um, the impact has been in Wilmington, North Carolina, and also in um, the panhandle of Florida. Last year, when Florence hit Wilmington, North Carolina, and parts other parts of the country, I was uh, preparing uh, to, to get going with the community here, the, the ACES Connection community in, in Wilmington, which started the community, and, and I had met with the the community manager, Mevin Boyd, and I learned about Elaine's work, and I called Elaine just out of the blue and said, Elaine, these guys are meeting. They've just been through Florence. They're absolutely devastated. It has been a horrifically challenging, terrifying time for them. Would you be willing to do a webinar with the leadership crew? Uh, of the new Hanover Resiliency Task Force in Wilmington, North Carolina. And Elaine said, well, when would they want to do it? And I said, well, nine o'clock, no, 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 no. And that's 6 a.m. Elaine's time. And so not only did Elaine, you know, get up at 4.30 or 5 that morning, but she also supplied um, the, the human power to, to do the webinar. And so we dialed in with, um, or zoomed in rather, with I think about 25 or 30 people from Wilmington. Elaine happened to be at, at Duke um, at the time because she does a lot of work with, with Duke. Um, yeah, that's right, because it was Michael that you were at home in California when right, you he had he was the one who got up early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Michael is the is the hurricane that got you up so early, but um, she was already in um, in Raleigh, um, Durham area. So we did a, a, a pop up webinar, and we we hope to do another pop up webinar soon. Um, I hope in, in in Texas because there's been a tremendous amount of trauma and um, pain in Texas. And also, Drew Pledger and Kevin McLeod were with me um, in Raleigh on that call. And Drew had already responded using the CRIM skills, and both of them are community re resiliency model teachers that are in the Raleigh-Durham area. Right. So North Carolina, actually, there are a couple of different models that are used in North Carolina, but I am constantly amazed. In, in New Hanover, uh, the response to the community resiliency model was so great that the New Hanover community leadership, um, the county leadership, decided to give uh, county employees uh, a, a day off to take the training if they wanted to take the training or um, a couple of hours off if they wanted to just to do the overview of the training. But um, I shared this with Elaine a few minutes ago. Uh, last night I was giving a talk to school nutrition, the, the school nutrition association. 
and I was in a little preschool where they, they meet at this beautiful preschool in, um, in Wilmington. And <laughs> I get there and the weather's, you know, getting bad. And so I'm rushing in, I've got all this stuff and I ask for where the ladies room is. And, and I head to the, to the accessible um, ladies room and I just had to laugh because the first thing I saw when I went in, and I hope you can see this, but was the, um, the sign up on the wall in the ladies room <laughs> that said, um, stressed, need help, um, download the iChill app. And so, you know, this is for the teachers and the parents who are at this precious little, little preschool. And then I'm walking down the hallway um, and, and here is the, um, one of the um, help now skills so that, you know, they have the, the 10 stations up or is it, how many stations is it Elaine? There's, there's 10 stations. That's yeah, that's skill five, which are the help now strategies that really help people get back into their okay zone when they're very bummed out. So I am just delighted to see here what, how people are implementing it. Cause this is why we say you were learning skills to integrate into your, your activities of daily living. And even at a preschool, Imagine if every little kid could learn how to regulate his nervous system. What a different world we'd have, right? Oh my gosh. Well, and actually, um, and then the, the, the funniest thing was, was that when I went to upload my, um, put my, my jump drive into the laptop that I was using to do the presentation, here is the, the cheat sheet. <laughs> it was everywhere I turned. Um, but that's how it is here because people were truly humbled by Lawrence. It um, was, was devastating and terrifying. And um, I have friends who are teachers and um, one who's a behavioral therapist for 41 pre-K classes here in New Hanover. And um, two of these teachers have teamed up and they will teach the community resiliency model to anyone that they can get to hold still long enough because they know that these little kids, when they go to school, um, and they talk about it. I went and visited um, my friend Kelly, who um, teaches at a, at a Title I school, and to hear these little kids talk about, well, I was bumped out of my zone, but I, you know, pushed against the wall and, and got myself back in my zone, or I breathed deeply and got myself back in my zone. I was afraid, and I got myself back in my zone, but the, the thing that I love here, too, is that we have um, so taken it to heart in Wilmington that uh, it was even recently at a beautiful museum here in, in Wilmington, our um, New Hanover Resiliency Task Force, which has more than 600 members. And this is the equivalent of, um, of the um, in, uh, Karen Clemmer in, um, in Butte, I mean, just who is a community facilitator for ACES Connection in uh, Northern California just uh, posted the Butte Thrives community on ACES Connection. She posted that so you can all see it and you can go to that website if you want to. But in New Hanover, the counterpart to that is called the New Hanover Resiliency Task Force. And it has more than 600 members. And the thing that I love is, um, and you know this is so true, Elaine, that um, climate change affects everyone but disproportionately affects the people with the least resources um, able to come back and bounce back. The people who, um, people who have, um, you know, don't have the extra couple of thousand dollars needed to, to get a new apartment or to, um, you know, to, to go stay at a hotel or to, um, you know, restock the refrigerators after they lose all their food or whatever. It makes it very, very difficult. So the, this community has done a, an incredible job of trying to make sure that, that it goes to every, every person in the community and that people in the neighborhoods are community leaders who are sharing this. But in the school system, because um, we believe that having it be a multi-generational approach, that the children are teaching the parents, the teachers are teaching the children, the, the children are teaching the teachers, and they're all teaching the parents together. Um, we did a wonderful project with art teachers, because um, we talk about aces in the arts, and we pulled in um, the arts teachers from 
uh, all the public schools in the area, and we all got together. And, and I played as though I was a teacher. I went to help present about ACES Connection there, but, but we, we had um, a table full of wonderful photographs of, I mean, literally hundreds upon hundreds of photographs that we could choose from to, to do our, um, our resourcing and our grounding to look for the items or the thoughts, the pictures of things that reminded us of how we could get back to our feeling of safety, our feeling of, um, of being able to, to be grounded, to shift our state, um, to get to our help now, um, to get to our self-care, to get to our tracking, and so that I could, um, so that we could expand our zones, expand our resiliency zones, and the teachers loved this, and it was a way to, um, Elaine, you look like you've got tears in your eyes, you're so happy. I'm so touched, I mean, really it is, I mean, this is about it being paying forward to all the different people that come in contact to a very simple model that's very adaptable and very accessible. And so seeing all of the skills, there's six skills all together in the model and seeing it all represented there, it's very touching. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. Um, well, you're so welcome. It was, it was a lot of fun and the teachers loved it. And of course, my hope was that they would take it back and do a similar project with their children. Um, and, and that even the, um, the theater teachers and the dance teachers who were there and the music teachers would go back and, and do something with this to take ACEs into the arts. And Carrie, and I think there's one other part when we talk about our new CPRP program is that we went into um, Wilmington. After we did the webinar, we went in as an institute and we trained about 30 people to be community resiliency model teachers. And so again, when you teach someone how to fish, then it does have that potential of spreading it through a community like you're seeing um, and what you're sharing with us. But I think then we had the next hurricane that um, sadly, um, I think that was Dorian, right? Was that the next one that came in? So now we have people that are already trained in the model. And so this is the preparation aspect that we're hoping we can do in every community in the United States in one day, which is why it's becoming a program, the CPRP program. Because then what happened, because I remember Membane did something in your local ACES connection there to remind people before the storm hit. If you could share that. that oh, I don't have the picture of it, but she sent out a, a wonderful, you know, m memo to, to all the members of the, the, the task force and asked them to please share it out to say, you know, we are stronger than we think and we are smarter than we know and, and we've got this, you know, we, we, we have each other, we're a community that is, it's, we're so much stronger than we are this, than we were this time last year, and we have resources, and, and, it, and it is quite remarkable because now, uh, because the, the county employees are being trained, all the emergency med techs, the fire department, the police department, um, you know, people at the hospital, uh, you know, they are infusing, they are embedding and embodying the language so that people can communicate more quickly and effectively with each other and to share what, this. The shared language becomes so important, but that means then that they were boots on the ground. It's exactly the model. So then they're ready to respond immediately. And I, I remember seeing it, she goes, remember your crim skills as, as the um, hurricane was approaching. So you can do that before, during, and after that is gonna help people to, to, as you said, all those beautiful words that you just said, in terms of being stronger to face the adversity that's ahead of them. Right, and, and, and truly the community pulled together. I was out of town, I had planned a trip to go visit my children in Montana, but um, you know, knowing, and I was in touch with a lot of people back in Wilmington during the time, but knowing that so many of them had those skills and we're sharing them through the churches, through the schools, through the workplaces, and then through the county employees, even the libraries. Um, it, it made a tremendous difference. I think it wove a network of, of an extra sense of, um, of being supported and lifted up uh, for the community. Yeah, and I, and I think this might be a, a nice segue in bringing Kelly on board for her really a lived experience of um, the recent, I guess, I can't believe it's been a year of the campfire that destroyed the community of paradise. So I'm wondering if we can bring Kelly on board right now. Um, Kelly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Kelly. And 
And, you know, Kelly, I'm, I'm wondering if you could share um, some of the things that your experience and how we first met um, way back, I think it was February of 2019. Yes, so um, after the fire, our local first five, Anna Bauer, had the community resiliency model. You all came out and did many trainings, and I was fortunate enough to attend the one-day training and really just fell in love with the model. Um, so after that, I wrote a grant to Red Cross and um, petitioned that we continue uh, learning more about this model in several of our communities. So when I became a trainer, um, we've already done the whole model in uh, surrounding communities, Chico and Oroville, and we're also doing it up in Paradise and Nagalia. Unfortunately, power's been going out, and so um, we are still doing the parenting trainings, and parents are just eating it up. Uh, they, they say, we don't have enough of these classes, and we want more, even though we've already done six sessions um, in the evenings. Um, and so that kind of speaks to how well this model works is when parents are wanting more. Well, could you give us maybe an example of what parents are saying about what, why it's helping them? I mean, there's so, so many models of intervention, but what do you think it is? Is it about the wellness skills? I think it's kind of a frame of mind of, okay, I don't have to feel so guilty for acting or thinking a certain way. I can just know that it is, and then I can reframe it in a more positive manner and then go from there. Or I can step back from the situation and take that resiliency pause um, or help myself to think about my strengths and my, my, my resource, and then I can move forward. Or I can help my child with their resource and thinking about their strengths um, and then get them back into the resiliency zone. And I, I think because you don't need materials or a lot of things, to um, use the model, it's just, you can use it anytime and anywhere. And again, it's just reframing things. And I think parents really appreciated being able to have something at their fingertips. And Kelly, would it be okay if you maybe shared how you've been using it? I know that we've had many conversations about, you know, having lost your home and moving to Chico and just how hard it's been for you and your kids. And yet you've been implementing some things. So if you could give us a little idea of how it might have helped you personally. Yeah, so you know, the day of the fire was very, very stressful. My younger son was asking, are we gonna die? And we went through nothing like some people went through, um, but it was still very stressful. And I think by just me staying calm, it allowed them to stay calm as well. Um, and then after I learned the resiliency skills, it was helping my children to kind of look at their resource, my, both my sons play soccer, and so I'd, if they were having a hard time, I would ask, okay, well, who are you playing next, and what do you love most about soccer, and tell me more, and so it would really distract them and get them back to being in their resiliency zone, um, and then my son, my younger son, started a brand new school where he didn't really know anybody, and he was really struggling, and so we, we took some deep breaths, we, you know, uh, drink some water. We did, we pushed against the wall a little bit and um, it really helped him. And then we went to the new school and checked it out. And then we finally got him transferred into a, a classroom where he was, he had a, a good friend. So that really helped. But I think by teaching them the resiliency skills, they are now able to do that a little bit more for themselves. And of course, I still give them reminders of okay, you know, let's think about soccer again, or um, let's think about those positive things. So, you know, when we, that's called conversational resourcing, and the reason yeah. why we kind of integrate those kinds of things in life that, that really um, uplift you, make you feel better, calmer, um, it helps to re-regulate the nervous system. And then when we, you know, some people say, well, are you only re-regulating the nervous system? What about your feelings and your thoughts? It's not that we don't pay attention to feelings and thoughts. Of course we do. But then when we can talk to someone once they're in that zone, they can say, well, gosh, mommy, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the only new person and I'm not going to know anybody. We don't think sometimes, I think, um, well, maybe we do, but we don't see it in the news that we only see like the fire and the immediate response, and we don't see the very hard job of rebuilding 
and what that's like for you as a mom with two little kids and getting a new home and, and all those kinds of things that they go through and we want to protect them from. Yeah, and I think it's a lot um, different. You know, we had said at the beginning, if it was just our house that burned down, it would have been so much easier because we would have just went out and bought another house. Um, this was quite different. Uh, not only did Paradise burn, but half of Megalia burned and Concow burned and parts of Chico burned. And so it was the whole surrounding community and we had to find new schools. My son's schools burnt down. Um, we had to find new libraries, new gas stations, new doctors, um, and and people that even didn't maybe lose their homes to the fire were being kicked out because they were in rentals and now there's a housing shortage and people are selling their houses. So the ripple effect is way bigger than I think people understand. And creating that new routine is, is really kind of hard and can be stressful, but I think having the resiliency piece and just being aware of sensations of oh, my, my fists are clenching. Um, I think maybe I'm getting bumped out of my resiliency zone and that's my signal to say, okay, whew, let's do some grounding and <laughs> take some deep breaths. And then um, noticing that and being able to um, kind of reset yourself. Yeah. And so, um, so Kelly, so I'm just curious. So you flew all the way down to you know, Southern California to become a CRIM teacher. So yeah. I know one thing, you know, coming to the class and learning the skills, what prompted you to, to want to do this? I mean, I know you're doing teachings in the community. Can you help us, you know, like if, why would this be a value to someone to learn how to be a teacher in your estimation, being a survivor? Well, I think because we work with so many parents who have gone through this um, event that I really wanted to be a trainer so that when parents come in, we can give them the skills. And then when I'm out in the community, I could give people skills. And even if I don't necessarily teach them what they are in that moment, I'm doing it with them. And hopefully just by me modeling it, they can be like, hmm, that really worked. And then they can do it with other people. Um, and if I know them well enough, I'll be like, hey, that was that skill. It really does work. And then um, they, they can use it. But really, I think everybody in our community is just in such need of that resiliency piece and the, and the hope that I felt like it was really important to become a trainer so that we can spread it within our community. And I know it really has been spreading. I know um, someone else just came and got trained by you um, at Butte College. And so if we can start training, um, I know tomorrow I'm doing a CREM training with Youth for Change. Um, and we work with tons of parents. And if our staff, we have at least 200 staff within the agency. And if we can go out and spread this um, in our communities, that would be really great. So um, Kelly, thank you so much. And is there anything else? I mean, I mean we want to give time to answer questions. Um, is there anything else that you think is really important for there's people that may be listening that have survived different climate change emergencies that um, throughout the country? Is there anything that you would like to say to them from your lived experience of, I know you're a very hopeful person. <laughs> Anything else you want to say from your from your heart? Um, a couple of things. One, you never know how someone's going to go through the experience. And so to have empathy, I know when I saw natural disasters on TV, it was like, oh gosh, best wishes for them. And then you kind of go on with your life until it happens to you. And then your life is forever changed. And so to have the empathy, even months and years later, uh, you don't really realize how it affects you. I know my sense of time is completely skewed now. Um, the other thing is the way we can help people. I know that so many generous donations came in um, and I know that was very helpful for us. So I just wanna send a huge thank you to everyone that helped us and others. Um, and it is very helpful for others. So now we, when natural disasters happen, we hope we are donating to them just to, because we know how important it is. Um, and so the love and kindness that goes out, even just a, we're thinking about you is really helpful. You know, there was one other thing that you shared with me that I didn't want to forget. And that was that, you know, you were lucky enough to get a house after. Yeah. And yeah. you shared with me that there were many people that were still living, even with their children in their cars. Is that still this way that it is, or is it getting better? 
Um, people are still struggling with housing. Uh, there are a lot more FEMA trailers available, but uh, that's a temporary stopgap. And so we're trying to still get people into housing. Um, that's very much that's still a, an issue here. Okay. So, I mean, if there's anything that we can do as community too, I think it's always, a, I know I, I was helpful when um, we heard in Florida, for instance, that they were still had so many people living in shelters that people donated children's books to read. So yeah. I know that those kinds of things, I mean, Carrie, remember that when we were oh, doing yeah. Florida one. Yeah. yeah, the Sesame Street people were wonderful to, to ship boxes of books. Um, they've been so good to, to think about children and trauma. But I tell you, there are some questions from some of the people who are watching the webinar. And, and I want to point out that we will be posting links to the other webinars. This is, I said, the third in a series of three. And in the other webinars, some of the resources that we've discussed are mentioned. But people are wondering, Elaine, um, if there's a way that they can get information about um, people in their respective states who are using or trained in this model. Do you have that information yeah, available yeah, on your yeah, website? Yeah, they can go on our website and they, you know, there's going to be a link to ask questions and it goes to one of our administrative assistants and then she feels those calls. So far, we're only in 22 states. I'm hoping one day it will be the um, all, all the 50 states that we'll be in. Um, so I can't guarantee we're in, in all the states, but we also do have... Um, uh, the community resiliency model teacher training programs um, and we offer them for the public and we also do a lot through agencies so there's public offerings offerings in southern california three times a year we're also at um, emory university in, in atlanta in march and we've scheduled two public trainings in north carolina one in november and one in at the end of april that will be one will be in the raleigh durham area and one will be in charlotte and I just had um, a call um, from some folks in Ohio because we responded to the shootings that were in Dayton with our, um, our CPRP model. That was kind of like our first um, going into a community with that. And they're gonna be doing, I believe, two teacher trainings, one in um, Columbus and one in, um, um, in Dayton. So those are not, the, the dates are not scheduled, but when they are, we will let people know. So we're always um, also open to the idea that if people can, like Membane did in Wilmington, she got different community organizations to come together. Sometimes it's a patchwork quilt of funding where we come in and can come to your community and launch a teacher training like we did in Wilmington where we trained 30. And we've also been just recently asked by Butte County in Paradise through their foundation that um, they did community meetings because so many people came in with interventions and many people in the community identified our model as one of the ones that was the most helpful. So we're gonna be going up into Butte, hopefully that all works out and training an additional 20 people. We're working out the details right now. That's so, great. And I've got um, Karen Clemmer, um, who is our North, West uh, California um, person for ACES Connection can can post that on that Butte uh, community website. But, but people are wondering if this model is also used and encouraged by state level emergency preparedness and response. Well, yes, but you know, I think it's, you know, our model, we tested our model through a state of California Mental Health Services Act um, through, through the Department of Behavioral Health in San Bernardino County um, and the state of California has a Mental Health Services Act and that was just 2010 to 2013. So it's only been six years, which is a very short time for a community-based model to kind of have the impact that it has had um, in the last six years. So we have more and more like county counties, um, like let's say in California, um, state uh, government funded things like first five so people come to us from different or um, state agencies but it hasn't been uniformly like accepted yet I hope it will as the as a, as the disaster preparedness for example for a certain state and that's one of the reasons why that it became clear to me that we needed to create the CPRP program because it needed to be um, able to um, be integrated, for example, in psychological first aid, which is a very good um, model of intervention that people use as um, um, endorsed by the World Health Organization. And we think that our model alongside PFA um, can really, really, really help communities because we provide so many interventions 
that people can use for themselves, which, you know, that teaching people how to fish element that Kelly described and also that you described, Carrie, I think is what sets us apart of something that can be, and it's pretty comparatively speaking, um, you know, once you have your own crim skills teachers, then it can be pretty inexpensive to continue to um, kind of uh, seed the community, so to speak, like you were, you were talking about this happened in Wilmington. Right, and, and we're getting some stories from people who are asking questions about um, people who have used these CRM skills and, and how it has truly changed their lives. Um, a widower um, in, in the Tootsie um, world who had lost her, her husband and um, was so hopeless, but was able to look after herself after she had three days of crim skill trainings and uh -huh. um, just uh, so many great stories that come out about uh, this one person, Samuel Habimamas, Habimana. Oh, oh, Samuel Habimana. He's Habimana, our, yes. He's a crim teacher in Rwanda in Kigali. And he, is, he started um, the Rwandan Resource and Grounding Organization after we were out there a couple times. And he has a great group of people, and they're also doing research through the um, um, through the University of Kigali. And um, we do try to help when we get donations to help Sam in his efforts in Rwanda. So if I'm, I'm going to say, if anybody wants to help Sam, you can always do a designated donation to us, and we will send it to Sam, who's doing lovely work in helping um, the community um, with another intervention that's helping with the genocide survivors. Isn't that wonderful? Somebody asked if there's a difference between TRM and CRM. <laughs> that, that, that could be a longer conversation. Yes, there is. So the trauma resiliency model is our model that's focused towards mental health professionals. And it is a intervention where therapists, psychologists, social workers, marriage family therapists, licensed clinical um, professional uh, counselors can use as a trauma reprocessing. So TRIM includes the wellness skills of CRIM, but then it has additional skills for trauma reprocessing. And we, we do offer TRIM as well, not as many as CRIM, um, because CRIM has really taken hold, but TRIM, we offer it mostly in California. We sometimes do trainings of TRIM in, um, in uh, North Carolina, as well as in upstate New York. So you have to go on our website site to see the TRIM trainings. That's great. And someone else, um, Tyria Anderson, asks whether or not we have done work with um, the juvenile justice system, any communities that have done community preparation with incarceration systems. And I know here in, in um, Wilmington is very much a, a part of, of, of everything that happens, but um, the incarcerated populations. Well, so we have had actually Doug Jackson works in um, Georgia with the juvenile justice system there. He recently became a, a he came, he became a community resiliency model skills teacher a, a, a little over a year ago. But he also has then sent some of the chaplains from the juvenile justice system. They were they came to our Atlanta training last March, and they're integrating um, it in in that system. And also, I, I personally have gone to a Chino Women's Prison here in California, and did an eight week course for um, women. Um, for women who've been incarcerated. So we have many people around the US that are, you know, if that's their interest and they work with prisons that are finding the community resiliency model to be very helpful. And um, also we have a lovely crim teacher in Belfast. Um, her name is Leslie Carroll and Leslie is a Presbyterian minister and she's the ombudsman for the prison system in um, Northern Ireland. And I'm going out there next month to do some work with her program for the prisons there in Belfast. So yes, and you know, I can remember one woman saying to me at the end of our eight week training we did at Chino and she said, she said, Elaine, if I would have known these skills, I realizing that every crime I committed, I was in my high zone. Mm. And I didn't have full access to my, to my prefrontal cortex because we teach about the brain in the model. And if I would have known these skills, maybe I wouldn't be here. It was very touching to me. And we also um, were cooking up some projects with Kevin McLeod in um, Durham, Raleigh, um, working with high-risk youth. But we have programs in um, Santa Maria, California with Edwin Weaver through Fighting Back Santa Maria that are also looking at prevention to hopefully 
that young people won't end up in prison. So yes, we are um, seeing some really good results in working in that way. That's great. And we've got some questions about um, links to um, training in specific areas. And I um, will post on the, the North Carolina ACES Connection website some information about trains in Wilmington. But um, also people wondering um, what ACES Connection or what the ACES movement is doing with regard to mobilizing and advocating to address the root cause of climate related trauma, which is truly representative of the way people who have experienced trauma pass trauma on and pass trauma on to the earth. Because as we say, hurt people hurt people and hurt people who are in their high zone or their low zone. You know, no crime is committed when you're in your high, you know, when you're in your resilient zone. But what we do to the earth when we're not, speak to that. Well, I think but, one of the things is that um, first of all, ACES Connection has been very welcoming to me through the Trauma Resource Institute and to Bob Dalpelt through the International Transformation Resilience Coalition, which um, our organization is a founding member. And Bob and I have worked very closely over the years in trying, and Bob, you know, he's so great with social policy in bringing it to the forefront of our legislators to talk about the human condition and the impact. And of course, if children and just th even thinking about what kelly was talking about her own children that if we don't help the children who have been impacted by these climate change events then they're going to have more difficulty that is very clear in the ace of science so i really appreciate all of you um you carrie and james stevens and gail kennedy who really reached out to us to collaborate in um we're just one intervention there are many interventions and I also want to say that very clearly that I think we need um, menu options when we're helping people who've experienced these, these climate change um, events, because not anyone is going to be helpful for every single person, right? But if we have different options, um, whether it's, you know, Tai Chi and movement and um, mindfulness strategies, um, as well as the community resiliency model skills, that there's a plethora of different things that we ha have to really be mindful of if we are going to help our community in the maximum way. Right, and, and I'm remiss because I have not posted the um, beautiful graphic that we have that is in, that's featured in some of the um, prior webinars uh, that is our, um, the three realms of ACEs science, okay. where we show that there are the, the family ACEs, the community ACEs, and now the climate ACEs, and what, what is happening as the result of climate change and the traumas that will, will come as a result of that. But people are wondering about um, what they can do, and Elaine um, and Kelly, I had shared with y'all a, a little questionnaire that CNN had created um, re recently, and I've posted it for um, the, the attendees if they want to take this interactive questionnaire um, from CNN that shows people some ways that they, in small ways, can, can take some action to help save the planet because small, small actions add up to big things. Right, and I think the other thing I really want to um, do a shout out for the ITRC. I don't know if you've already po posted that, but people can become, um, you know, can link on to what um, the ITRC is doing globally that's helping with bringing this attention to not only individuals like all of you, but to also policymakers. So I really like to say that. And also, um, I think the, what Kelly said about before this happened to her, she would, of course, you know, think about communities, but it wasn't the same. It's not like it is right now. And I think if we can prepare ourselves, because they're going to happen, sadly, and right now we have a climate where um, we're seeing this every day, and there's so much sorrow and suffering happening as a result of it for the human condition and also what's happening to our Earth. Um, but to prepare yourselves now, um, think about prevention. And also, I think if you take that questionnaire, you can see some of the concrete things you can do to um, help your home and your community be more um, mindful 
Yes. And so Elaine and Kelly, again, thank you so much. And for people whose questions were not answered because we are sadly out of time, um, we will answer the final questions in the summary. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.